Hello, AP Psychology students. Um, you know, it's a beautiful day here in Minnesota. I can hear the wind because of my ears and the temporal lobe that hears the sound. I can feel it on my skin because of um, the sensors that are under my skin and, and the parietal lobe that helps me to feel skin sensations. And when I hear the wind, I remember time spent on lakes here in Minnesota and how um, I had wonderful memories of um, being at um, the, the lake with my grandma or with my children. And so many of us here in Minnesota have memories on or around lakes because that's just kind of a part of what we have here. And um, that is thanks to our hippocampus. As I go through this unit, I think what's really going to be important is to try to take these uh, brain structures that I talk about and personalize them. Make them your own. Think about something that you do that uses that part of the brain. And I'm going to do the best that I can to explain it, but um, nothing really beats just making it your own, making it real to you. I love this, this spinning woman here. To me, she is always turning clockwise. And um, I can't see her any other direction. Unless I try really high, hard, I close my eyes, I blink, and once in a while, I can get her to turn the other direction. This is one of the mysteries of the brain. Why do some of us naturally see her spinning one way and others see her spinning the other? And that's because the part of our brain that takes in that image and it goes back to the back of our part of the brain, the back of our brain called the occipital lobe. It tries to figure out where she is in space. Really, she's just going back and forth. She's not going any particular direction, but our brain is wired to find meaning in what we see, and therefore we create meaning out of seeing her. So today I'm going to be talking about the hind brain or the, the what are called the old brain structures. And in the next video, I'll talk about this whole folded mass on top that's called the cerebral cortex. So when you think about the brain, think about three primary regions. Um, and, if, and if you wanna think about some animals, here's a way to think about it. This is your reptile brain, okay? This is the lizard that can snap at a mouse, or not a mouse, a, a bug outside of its field of vision. It just reacts, it, it knows what to do um, just to survive. This is our puppy brain. And if any of you have a puppy or a dog, you know that they are very emotional and very responsive to um, the emotions around them. So I kind of think of this as our puppy brain. And then all of this, this really advanced part in humans is our thinking brain. or Some people call it the neocortex or new cortex. So, um, Evolutionarily speaking, we would say that this was first to develop, followed by this, followed by this. Um, so that is um, what we're going to start with. Then is the the like the reptile brain. So I would recommend going to your diagrams and finding the one that looks like this as we label and describe the parts of the brainstem. Now the brainstem itself is the stalk on which this larger part of the brain sits. It is um, anatomically distinct and its primary function is survival. This first structure here, the medulla, if you follow the arrow, it's the bulge right about here, okay? And that bulge is absolutely critical for heart rate and breathing. If you have damage to the medulla, you're not likely to survive it because it is that critical. Um, just sitting above the, uh, the medulla is a fairly large bulge right here called the pons. The pons, that word means bridge. So it relays information from the cerebellum, which I'll talk about in a minute, to the cerebrum and back. Okay, so this is is it's kind of a, a sort of a messenger, um, but it also 
paralyzes your muscles during REM sleep. Now, REM sleep is when we generally dream. And so it's important that you don't like move around during REM sleep because you could hurt somebody um, or yourself if you're moving around during your dreams because some of them can be pretty active as I'm sure you know. The reticular formation you can see on this diagram is actually a bundle of neurons that goes um, the entire length of the brain stem. This controls alertness and arousal. If you hear something, it's your reticular formation that's going to pay attention to it. If it's something that's important, maybe it's your baby that's crying at night or another noise that you hear while you're sleeping, your reticular formation is going to help you to notice that um, important thing that's out there that you need to pay attention to. It also filters incoming stimuli even while sleeping. That's why I mentioned the baby crying. You may not um, hear the baby a baby cry if you don't have a baby, but if you do have a baby, your brain is kind of specially tuned in to hear your baby cry so that you wake up and take care of it. Now, that's the brainstem region. Sitting on top of the brainstem region is a structure and it sort of looks like an egg. Um, and so in class, I can show you the three-dimensional model of it, but there, there are these like egg shaped, they're small, but they're two structures and they're on either side of the brain and uh, they're, they're somewhat egg shaped. Um, think of this as a relay station. So all of your senses except smells, so your sight, sound, taste, touch, and he, uh, well, I already said hearing, they all go through, so they come up through whatever organ it is, the eyes, the ears, the skin, and they'll go through the thalamus, and then they'll go up into other regions of the brain that need to pay attention to what um, that stimuli is. The cerebellum, you can see this very anatomically distinct as well, um, and it sits sort of in the back of your head, kind of right behind the brain stem. Now, this has some very important functions. In fact, it's called the little brain. It's that important. It is 10% of your total brain weight. Um, and it has more neurons than the rest of the brain. So these are really tiny neurons, tightly bundled. And in fact, it's important for coordination and balance. I knew of someone that had a stroke in their cerebellum and they thought that they had an ear infection because part of our ear controls balance as well. But sure enough, when he got to the hospital and had a CAT scan done, he couldn't walk straight. Well, the reason why is because he had a vessel burst in his cerebellum. Now he was able to recover and go back to work and do just fine. But um, this is also the part of the brain that is most affected by alcohol. So as we've talked about already, alcohol affects many regions of the brain um, and it affects especially the cerebellum um, as well as GABA and glutamate as we talked about before. And, and that's going to affect your balance. This also is a part of your brain where your muscle memory is. So just as an example of what muscle memory is, you know, when you were maybe in kindergarten, you were learning to write the letter A for the first time. And you had to think about just about where to start it, how to make the little circle, how to make the little line at the end. I'm pretty sure none of you need to think about that anymore because there's somewhere here in your cere cerebellum that knows exactly how to draw the letter A. I already mentioned this, um, just worth repeating. So this part of the brain, really important for that muscle memory, coordination, and balance. Then we get to the limbic system. This is the puppy part of the brain, right? This is the part that processes and regulates emotions. There are several really, really important structures here. And again, I'm going to ask you to try to make it personal. Think about something that you remember. How about what you had for dinner last night? I had a taco burger. I had never had a taco burger before and I remember it because it was unique. My daughter made it for me and I remember it because my hippocampus helped me to remember it. So the hippocampus 
is this structure here. It is a, a sort of a C-shaped structure, and it's sort of embedded deep into the brain. We know that this area of the brain is important for memory transfer. Later on, we'll talk about short-term versus long-term memory, but it is vital that the information that comes to us in order to get into our long-term memory has to go through the hippocampus. So guess what part of the brain is impacted by Alzheimer's disease? Um, it is the hippocampus. I don't have that as a note here, but I, I would like you to write that down, that Alzheimer's is indeed uh, the part of the brain that starts to diminish in capability. It actually starts to shrink in response to Alzheimer's disease. And there are, there are a lot of explanations for that. We can look at that another time. But um, as many of you know, that is a very difficult disease of memory. Now the amygdala is a structure right here at the end of the hippocampus this is really an important structure for handling aggression, fear, and strong emotion. If, for example, a, a dog comes running towards you and it wants to bite you, your response might be to be afraid, to uh, you know, fall down and curl into a ball, or to um, or to run to safety. It's the amygdala that's going to help you to do that. Um, and so with Phineas Gage, we saw, if you watched that video, which I hope you did, that the metal rod that went through his brain severed the uh, frontal lobe right up here from the amygdala so that he was acting out of purely that amygdala, that aggression, fear, strong emotion. He couldn't control it. We'll learn later on that the frontal lobe helps us to control that. The hypothalamus is also critical to our everyday functioning, and it is right in here. Um, the hypothalamus is what helps our body to maintain homeostasis. So as you know, if you're hot, you sweat. If you're cold, you'll have chills. If, you hung if you're hungry, you'll eat. If you're thirsty, you'll drink. So these are all things that are controlled by the hypothalamus. It knows how to keep our body in homeostasis. It is also responsible for the four Fs. So we call these the fight or flight response. So again, the brain helps us to know if we're gonna fight, let's say back in you know the caveman days, I have my four babies behind me in a cave and a wolf comes towards me. Well, I might fight that wolf to protect my, my babies. But if I'm on my own, I might run if I feel like I can run and climb up a tree or do something that will get me away from the wolf that's trying to chase me. So fight or flight is really important. It's initiated by the hypothalamus. And then as you know, as I talked about in another unit, it, it will um, help the adrenal gland to produce adrenaline. The other two are feeding and fornication. Um, so uh, feeding, that means you're eating. And then fornication means reproduction or basically our, our sex drive. So um, that's what the four Fs refer to. And so they're really responsible not only for keeping ourselves alive, uh, fight, flight, and feeding, but for keeping our species alive. The pituitary gland is attached to the hypothalamus, and this is the master gland of the endocrine system. You should have already studied the endocrine system. If you have not, I recommend that you go back to the textbook and you look up the endocrine system. The endocrine system overall directs hormone production, which are chemicals that are released through um, our bloodstream instead of neurotransmitters, which are released across the synaptic cleft. So um, what I'd like you to do before you um, uh, actually for your ABA today is I'd like to look at my son here. He's playing rugby um, and he was in Florida when he did this. And this is a game which would particularly stimulate four of these old brain structures. So identify, go back and look at all the structures I just talked about. Identify which ones you think would be particularly active while one is being tackled, running, trying to execute the rugby ball in a, in a way that he's going to get a score, um, and explain why you think those particular 
for instructors are particularly active. Thank you for your attention today. And again, make it personal. Go back and look at each of those brain structures and think, think about something you do. Maybe it's uh, playing a sport like rugby or soccer or wrestling or tennis, or maybe it's studying, but you should be able to apply all of those brain structures to a particular activity that is the best way that you're going to remember it. And then the other thing is to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Thank you for your attention.